been said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And it means that copying somebody and what they're doing is a way of saying that you, that you look up to them and you, you respect them. You, you appreciate what they're doing and you want to be like them. You want to do like they do. I mean, you just think about how many uh, young men have imitated Odell Beckham Jr.'s signature style of catching a football with one hand. I was watching uh, some sports footage of this NCAA team where the receivers were practicing this just for hours, you know, purposefully throwing the ball way over somebody's head so that they could catch it like that. And you began to actually see more of those kind of catches in college football and in the pros. And an imitation is just a natural way that we learn. And, uh, and it can be either good or it can be bad. It all depends on who you're imitating and why. <laughs> but if you turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 this morning, we're going to see that imitation is also a very important part of how disciples are made for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the people at Thessalonica had imitated uh, Paul and his companions. And, and as they had imitated them, they had grown into this thriving, vibrant church and, and that had grown to be an example to the churches all around. And if you weren't here a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how that this church had gotten started in Thessalonica and how that Paul hadn't been able to stay there as long as he wanted to. And, and, but as we see that, that when he wrote to these people, that the, these folks were doing great. And if you'll take time to read the, the letter of 1 Thessalonians this afternoon, just read the whole thing through and you'll see that this was one church, unlike many of the churches that Paul started, that, that didn't cause him grief, that, that he was just so thrilled and so happy with how they're doing. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, labor of love, steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can go back and read in Acts chapter 17 and see how this church was started. And then how it, that he, he had to leave them sooner than he wanted to, but how that the Holy Spirit had just made such a radical change in these people's lives. And he said, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. And after he had sent Timothy back, and, and Timothy had come back with this glowing report uh, of how these people had, had grown in just such a short time to this body of loving, committed, faithful people serving the Lord, uh, Paul was just overjoyed. And as we pick up today in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, here in verse 5, we're going to see how that their imitation of Paul and Silas and Timothy while they were there had played a key role in producing this radical change in their lives. In verse 5, Paul writes this. He says, You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we do not need to say anything. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we begin. Lord, as we take a look this morning at this group of people who lived so long ago, or who imitated the Apostle Paul and his companions, and who became an example for the churches all around. Lord, may they serve as an example for us 2,000 years later as your Holy Spirit has preserved this word for us to read. And Lord, may we take it. And Lord, may we be imitators of their faith as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, the people at Thessalonica, they had a very solid example to imitate. When you think about who they imitated, they were imitating Paul and Silas and Timothy. And he says, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and the Lord. And people saw what kind of people they were. It, it wasn't just words. They weren't just gathering and hearing words being taught. They, they saw the lives of these men. 
And they imitated them. They imitated their lifestyle. They imitated their character. And this is actually a very powerful statement about how disciples are made. You know what Paul told the believers at the city of Corinth where, where he worked with them? When he wrote them a letter, he said, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of a heavy thing to think about saying to somebody. Do like I do because I'm following Jesus. You know, it kind of makes you uncomfortable, doesn't it? But, but here it is. I mean, this is what Paul said to them. And Paul was happy that these people at Thessalonica were imitating him. And he urged the people at, 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 at Corinth to imitate him because he understood that disciples are not just made by hearing the word of God, as important as that is. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But disciples are also made by seeing the word of God lived out in somebody's life. I mean, just think about how Jesus did it. When Jesus called the first apostles, when he called his disciples, it says he called them, he spoke to them, and he said he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Jesus didn't just gather up these guys and set them down in a classroom and teach them a bunch of lessons and say, hey, this is how it's done. He called them so they would be with him for three years and they traveled around all over, all over the land of Israel, here and there in Galilee and Jerusalem and Judea. And, and yeah, he taught them. He taught them verbally, but he also taught them with his actions. He lived things out before them constantly all the way through his whole ministry up to the very last night before he went to the cross. Because as he, as he washed their feet and, and, and took that role of a servant, he said, I have given you an example so that you should also do just as I have done. And the Apostle Paul, taking Jesus' example of discipleship, he did this over and over and over and said this over and over to the people he was working with. To the people at Philippi, he said, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me. Do these, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, how do you see the word of God lived out in somebody's life? Can you see that just by hearing a preacher preach on Sunday morning? I mean, you might be able to see a little bit. I mean, a person's character will show somewhat in the things that they say, in the way that they preach, or the way that they teach Sunday school. But the way that you really see how they live is by being with people. And, and Paul and Silas and Timothy, they were, they were mingling around with the people with whom they work. You have to spend time with them. And if you want to have an impact on people, you have to spend time with them somewhere outside the four walls of this church. In settings where, where, you're not just, where you're not just sitting in a group and hearing the message being preached as important as that is. But you need to be out where, you, where you're spending time with people outside where they can see the word of God lived out in your life. Brandon and I were talking about this this week and just how that we sometimes tend to take a lot for granted when we're trying to make disciples for Jesus. I mean, just take, for example, just a, some really basic scriptural teaching from the word of God. Like, for example, like, like how to go to work. What do you do when you work? And we know the Word of God says, whatever you do, whatever work you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. And we'll see later on, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said to, he, he, he told them to aspire to live quietly, to work with your own hands, mind your own business, the way that we told you. And as I say those things, when I say, whatever work you do, do it heartily, that is going to produce a word picture in your mind of what hearty work looks like. But you know, that picture is not going to be the same in everybody's mind. Because not all of us have had the same examples of work growing up in our formative years. And I was thinking about this, you know, what, what, for the first 18 years of my life, I had the example of a dad who got up every morning and went to work. And who went to work cheerfully. And not only that, when he came home, 
He went to work on the farm. He took care of the cattle. And he took care of all the other things that needed to, to be done around the house. I had the example of a mother who got up at 5 o'clock every morning, read her Bible, and then spent the day working. She was cleaning house. She was baking bread. She was canning beans. She was doing all these things. And not only that, these two people, they made me work. They saw to it that every day I got out of bed when I was supposed to go to bed and got on the bus and went to school. They saw to it that my assignments were done and if I did not do them right and they heard something from the teacher, I had to go back and do it again and there was a price to pay. I had to make my bed every day when I got up. I had to clean my room every Saturday before I went out to play. Later on, I had to stack firewood when I was wanting to be watching ACC basketball on Saturday afternoon. I had to split wood. I had to put up fence. I had to haul cinder blocks. All these things, whether I was willing or unwilling, most of the time unwilling. But see, I had 18 years to learn about what work was. But let's just say we have an event like Reverb, or, or you meet somebody in the parking lot at Walmart, and you strike up a spiritual conversation, and you begin to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they understand what you're saying, how that you know, God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die in our place. And the reason he had to do that is because we're all sinners. We've all sinned against God. We're separated from him. But God wanted to reconcile us to himself, and so he gave his son to die in our place and raised him from the dead. And that person repents and says, hey, I, man, count me in. Man, I, I know I'm a sinner. I want to be set free from my sin. And they, and they confess Jesus as Lord, and they believe in their heart that, that God raised him from the dead, and they're saved. Praise the Lord. But then they read a verse about work, and, and it may be that the only example they've ever had of work is of, man, do as little as possible, get paid as much as possible. And, and so how are they going to learn what a biblical work ethic really looks like? How are they going to learn that? They have to learn it by seeing you. They have to learn it by being together with God's people and seeing what that is. And it's the same thing with, with, with what about your marriage? How do I treat my wife now? How do I raise my kids? You know, what, how, do, how, do I, how do I manage my business? All these things. They're going to learn these things by seeing, by being together with you. And, uh, and, and, just, and just as you're thinking about this, um, you know, every, 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 everything that we learn, everything that, that we've had, we've had some kind of an example there. And we're to be living out examples for one another. And we're to be following those examples. And in this way, this is how disciples are made. And, and when I think about when I first uh, began to, and some of you guys have been doing this for years. Uh, some of you have been uh, taking young men camping, and you take these guys camping, and you, and you teach them how to kayak, and you teach them how to put up a tent, and you, and you teach them how to chop firewood, and how to identify plants in the forest. And that's great, but you know what these guys are learning when they're there, and you're teaching them all these things? They're not just learning about how to identify plants in the florist and how to kayak and how to, and how to split wood. They're learning about what it means to be a godly man by being around you. Some of you gather ladies together for quilting and you're sitting there sewing your stitches and you're, and you're crocheting and, and doing these things. Are, are, are these people just learning about crocheting and, and learning about quilting? No, they're sitting there talking about life as well. And this is why it's just so valuable, you know, to get together in, in groups in people's homes. Because it's one thing for me to sit here and say, you know, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring up your children to the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But man, when you're in a small group and you're in somebody's house and your kids are running around and their kids are running around and, and, and they look and say, well, tell me, how do you get your kids to behave? How come your kids listen to you and my kids don't listen to me? Or, 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 man, my kid is having so much trouble in school, and I just don't know what to do about it. And you see, that's how we learn, by being with each other. And, 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 it's, and Paul realized this, and, and this is also called mentoring. And it's something that needs to be going on. It's an essential part of making disciples in the life of every healthy church. And when I was a teenager and showing interest in the ministry, 
our former pastor, Howard Merrill, uh, he didn't give me books about how to go visit people in the hospital. He didn't give me books about preaching. He didn't give me books about doing things in vacation Bible school. You know what he did? Took me with him to the hospital so that I could go with him while he was visiting people and see how it was done. He sent me up to Dolly Ann to, to, to talk to kids and get to know kids. I used to come back with a whole you know, car load full of kids for vacation Bible school years ago when we were doing that. And he didn't give me books about preaching. He stuck me up here and he said, preach a message on Sunday. <laughs> and lots of times I had very little idea of what I was doing. And some of you who have been here for a while, you may even remember suffering through that. <laughs> but that's how you learn. You learn by imitating. And, 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 here's, and that also brings up another question, though. What kind of an example are you giving people to imitate in your life? Uh, would you want people to imitate your obedience to the word of God? Would you want people to imitate you in your marriage? And Sarah Egerich uh, put it in a pretty pointed way when she said, when your son is married, would you want his wife to treat your son the way you're treating your husband right now? Would you want to invite people to imitate your prayer life? Would you want to invite people to imitate your witness to other people? But here's the deal. <laughs> people will be imitating you, whether you realize it or not. Especially if you are a parent of small children. People are going to be, are going to be imitating you all the time. Uh, some of you might remember Tim McGraw had this song out quite a few years ago where he talks about he's riding around in the car and his little boy is sitting in the back seat eating his McDonald's Happy Meal. And... He knocks his drink over and he hears this language coming from his child's mouth that he didn't even know that the little boy knew. And he said, son, where'd you learn to talk like that? And the boy said, I've been watching you. Dad ain't that cool. I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you. <laughs> People are watching us all the time. And so be sure that you're setting an example that you would want people to imitate. And say, so how specifically did the people at Thessalonica imitate Paul and, and, and Silas? Well, one way they imitated them was in their response to the word of God. And they showed this in two areas. They said, you, receive, you became imitators of us in that you received the word in much affliction. And when they heard the message of God's word, this wasn't some kind of casual, warm, fuzzy thing that was a convenient option to do. They knew right from the very start, from what they had seen had happened to Jason, the man who had, who had provided lodging for, for Paul and Silas and Timothy, and how the, there had been a riot and this guy had been hauled out in the street and taken to the magistrate and threatened, and they took him under bond, which means, you know, basically they said, any other problems happen because of this Christianity thing, you're going to be the one that we come to see. And that's why Paul left town, because he didn't want his friend Jason to have to pay for this. And so he, he left town just so, so things would sort of cool off. And they knew right from the start that them becoming followers of Jesus was going to cast them under a shadow of persecution right from the very start. They received this word in affliction. But because they saw the example that Paul and Timothy and Silas had had, they imitated the commitment. They imitated this commitment that they saw in them that they, that because they were willing to sacrifice for this message. When they came on board with Christianity and put their trust in the Lord Jesus, they came with that same mentality right from the start. They received the word in much affliction. And uh, here's another question for you. Do you remember this church? I'm speaking to people who know the Lord, those of you who are, who are members here. What kind of church would this be if every other member of the church followed your example of commitment? If people followed your example of commitment, 
Would this be a church where people are excited about hearing the word of God and, and putting it into practice throughout the week, gathering together to study it, treasure it, telling other people about Jesus, willing to sacrifice their time to, to, to serve in different ways? Or if they imitated your example, would they meet together once a week when it was convenient? And that would be about it. If people followed your example of commitment, would everyone here be involved in some task in which they're using their spiritual gift, using their talent, using their ability so that things could get done? Would people be sharing their faith because that's what you do? Or would there be no one to clean the church because you won't clean it, no one to care for the children in children's church because you can't be bothered with that? And just nothing would much get done at all.